tonight I'm going to talk about three projects. And I've sort of framed it in relation to place because um, that's the name of the exhibition that my work is in. Can you hear me? Okay. Because um, when we think of place, we often think about people dwelling in a place or being connected to a particular location. And there's a geographer, Tim Cresswell, who's pointed out that when we look at the world, we look at the world of places, we see attachments and connections between people. And we see world, worlds of meaning and experience. And so this is a way of framing what I'm going to be talking about because it is about experience, it is about connection, and it's also about loss. And I'm going to discuss my involvement in three visual art projects connected to place. And the places have a significance to me because of my personal history. But I think they have a wider significance in Australia for the histories they hold and the unresolved tensions that they reveal about our colonial past and our present. So the first place I'm going to talk about is the Murray River. Um, it extends, as you all know, from Corrigan, um, right through to the Murray Mouth in South Australia. Um, and living in Adelaide near the mouth of the river, um, and like other South Australians at the end of the line, I'm really conscious of the environmental issues that beset the Murray, and they've beset the Murray since colonisation. Um, and this was really brought home to me when I was involved in a project called, um, that was um, organised by the Centenary Federation called Weaving the Murray during 1999-2000. Um, they involved three, uh, art, sorry, seven artists, three Indigenous artists, and four non-Indigenous artists, including myself. And the project was developed to celebrate Federation by the South Australian Centenary of Federation Committee. And they wanted to acknowledge the role of the Murray River in, in um, um, joining the three states. And as you can see here from the Murray Valley Basin, it extends right across, sorry, four states in Australia. And for the committee, they thought that the project would symbolise the ideals of federation as a celebration of democracy through commissioning a group of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australian artists to weave a cultural map of the river. Well, the resulting artworks did not so much as celebrate democracy as an institution as reveal the tensions that have underpinned the care and control of the river for over 200 years. And so we became aware of these tensions through our research into the past history of the Murray River and its symbolic role in the process of federation. And it was seen as a unifying symbol between these four states. But even at Federation, there were disagreements about the management of the river between, between the states themselves and between interest groups within the states. And of course, no notice at all, at all was taken of Indigenous people's rights and responsibilities over the river. And they understand the river as a sentient being um, that in, you know, involves um, rights and responsibilities from all the people who live along its banks. We made two trips along the Murray River. Uh, it's 2,570 kilometres in length, and we collected stories and artefacts from local communities so we could develop a work that really mapped their relationship to the river. And the stories that people told us were really integral to the design and making of Weaving Up the Murray. Making textiles and storytelling, as you would all know, are linked. Um, of course, the English phrase spinning a yarn means both spinning but also telling a story. And in Naranjeri culture, and the Naranjeri, the people that live at the mouth of the Murray, um, yarning also means passing on one, um, so, sorry, knowledge from one generation to the next. And the circularity of the stories that um, Ellen mentions is um, by continually bringing the past into the present to create the future, is actually echoed in the way baskets are made, in this circular basket being made by. Um, Yvonne Kulmatri. They're made through a process of looping forward and back in an ongoing process to create the form. So listening to stories from both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people was a key to gathering knowledge for this particular project. And we exchanged them through informal workshops where we shared our weaving skills with the communities and we listened to what they said about their relationship with the river. And on our second trip, Nigel Sweet and the sound recorders recorded voices for the soundscape that permeated the final installation. 
And as Jackie Kelly from Swan Hill said so eloquently, the river is the lifeblood of the community. So in the installation, the narrative of the work itself with its combination of weaving, photography, sculpture, installation and found objects was developed from historical research and fieldwork on community sites. And in fact, the words of the community are permeate the space through the oral part of the work, but they're also visible in the, the structures that we made. And we wanted people to be able to be immersed in the installation and walk through it. And there are five interconnected sections which begin with the um, story of the creation of the Murray River represented by Pondy, the giant Murray cod. Now, Pondy was created collaboratively under the guidance of Rhonda Ages with all the artists contributing. And we collected the rush for the, the fish from many places along the river and we used the traditional Navanjeri weaving technique of coiling form of coiling to create the form of the fish. <clears throat> While Pondy, I suppose, tells the story of the creation of the river, flooded gardens actually tells the story of the structure. Because as we drove along the river, we really noted the dead trees and the water, and we collected all these sticks from the hewn weir. Uh, and we heard many um, stories about the change in water quality. For example, Peter Tremaine from Albury said that once you could see to the bottom of the Murray River, it was so clear and clean. And now, of course, the water is turbid and brown. If you drop anything in it, you'll probably never see it again. Um, <clears throat> so we created. Um, an installation of um, um, some sticks gathered from the, the weir and room with salt to symbolise the rising salinity levels of the damage in the river. And of course, this issue is so much worse now with the um, changes in water quality and the Murray Darling um, that feeds into the Murray and that the water has actually become undrinkable. Um, and so, this project was probably 20 years ago, and it's really heartbreaking to see that things have actually got so much worse with time. Along one wall of the installation space, <coughs> we created a continuous stream of words from the five of the rushes that grow along the banks, making reference to the use of string as a key technology for Indigenous Australian people. And the river itself is symbolising a long community, more an idea than a reality these days. And on the wall, facing the string text, we placed a grid of textile objects referencing the traditions of Indigenous and settler communities. And they refer to the domestic and rural labour that supported the trade, the fishing and the farming practices that formed the economy of the river. And this economy you know, has both been valuable, but it's also contributed to the river's declining health. And as Sydney Moko Mee noted, the grid structure reveals the anxiety underpinning, underpinning colonisation it's an anxiety expressed through the practices of mapping and naming, a way of controlling the fear of the unknown. I'm just going to talk about a couple of works from the, the grid. And the consequence of the failure to unite the states of Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia and Victoria in the management of the Murray Darling Basin is signalled by two string bags that mark how irrigation practices and the introduction of water hungry crops like cotton have damaged the health of the river. So we have an indigenous netted bag made from plant fiber hung alongside its counterpart, which is netted with salt encrusted cotton rags. And within the grid, European and indigenous cultural practices are sometimes combined, I suppose, to form a hybrid object that speaks hopefully of working together, even when they allude to stories of dispossession. A Nurunjeri sister basket formed by the two cut halves joined together like this to symbolise familial connection has been remade in the ubiquitous fabric of the settlers, Yim Chek. And in this hybrid basket, the spiral form of the structure overlays the normally dominant check of the grid. And all the objects in the, um, the grid were hung with tagged, as in a museum, but rather than identifying the object with date and provenance, the, um, the tags had images and text that opened up a range of reasons readings um, and, <clears throat> and in fact the words to the right of the image are on the tag attached to the sister basket, basket. and these are the names of the sister cities now facing each other on opposite banks of the, of the, of the river. But it's a very beautiful text if you read it out loud it's like a poem. 
As viewers walk around the physical installation of Leaving the Murray, and they can also hear the voices of the river people playing in the background, a reminder to everyone um, about the information they've given us um, throughout the project. And it was really their stories of loss and hope from the river that was communicated through the sound state and through the materiality and the association with the objects that form the basis of the work. And now, 20 years later, we seem to be even further away from developing and enacting policies that will save the health of the river, driven as we are by disagreement still between the states and interest groups and the lack of political will and vision. But the next project I want to discuss is also about water. But this place it's in the Kimberley um, Peninsula, north of Broome in Western Australia, where I made a body of artwork and then curated an exhibition at the Sasa Gallery in 2008 about the cultural resonance of Mother of Pearl Shell for multiracial communities living in the Kimberley. And it was called This Everything Water. And it began a kind of synchronicity that sometimes underpins a creative process with the intersection of three seemingly disparate themes. Um, I had a collection of pearl buttons. <coughs> I can't even remember when I started to collect them, but they're enthralling objects for their magical luster, their weight, their infinite variety. And before the cultured pearl industry um, began in the mid-19th century and that made pearls inexpensive, mother of pearl buttons actually enabled ordinary people to access the wonderful luminosity of the pearl very, very cheaply. And I've always been interested in this image of a mosaic of skull, which is part of the last judgment in the church of Santa Maria Tocello in Italy. And the mosaic is one of the last things the congregation would see as they left the church, a reminder of mortality in the afterlife. And then one day I was listening to the radio and I heard the writer John Bailey talking about his book, The White Divers of Broome, on ABC Radio. And it takes a historical look at the development of the pearling industry in Broome, and he describes how at first Aboriginal divers were co-opted to dive for pearls and shell, and later divers from Southeast Asia were brought in, and it sort of culminated in an attempt to introduce white divers into the industry after the White Australia policy was enacted in the early 20th century. <coughs> the policy that we all know was designed to keep Asian people out of Australia. And when I read Bailey's book, I was struck by the two paragraphs on the slide. The first describes an autopsy on the first white diver to die from the beans in Broome, and the second describes an incident of casual and callous violence that indicates the deep racism evident in the pearling industry in the early part of the 20th century. And the two incidents described in the slide really encapsulate the impact of colonialism on Aboriginal people of the Kimberley. There was the frontier violence that accompanied the development of pastoralism and the pearl industry, and the establishment of Christian missions that, while offering a haven against that violence, also participated in the destruction of traditional cultural and social practices. So when I was thinking about um, <clears throat> how the pearling industry was responsible for the deaths of Aboriginal people, sometimes kidnapped and forced to die for shell, I created what I think of as a sort of blanket memorial, using the Torcello mosaic as a model for the pearl button skull stitched on a blanket. Well, I call white work, it's a reference, of course, to white work embroidery, but it's also a reference to the work that we as white Australians have to do to come to terms with our history. Um, and Aboriginal scholars now talk about how the category of race has been applied to Indigenous people in a discriminatory manner. So white is the norm and black is regarded as the other and often as inferior. But to turn this around and think about whiteness is to consider how white power and privilege have been used to discriminate against Indigenous people in Australia. And so this was a position I undertook in creating this artwork. It was really to investigate and review white attitudes to the history of the pearling industry. And through doing this, through working with the materiality of objects, blankets, buttons and skulls. And I used the colour of white, literally, because most of the objects are white, but also metaphorically. The first version of the work comprises four blankets. It was shown in two ways, white piece, but also on a desk that was shrouded in a white cloth. 
But the final version, I put some blankets under the desk, and out the other side, out of mine, and on the desk is an artist's book that I compiled, um, designed by John Mallory, called White, a glossary of terms, that includes many references to the term white as used in an Australian context. I'll just give you one example, the white man's burden. This is what my father used to call us children when we were growing up in Papua New Guinea. Well, the white man's burden in the days of imperialism was a duty um, supposed to be imposed upon the white races, especially the British, to govern and educate the less civilised and backward coloured people. So the book is full of phrases that have all these uh, um, references to white. When I made this work, I'd never been to Rome, but I was so intrigued. And so I decided I would actually need it to go there and physically experience the place itself. And being in Broome made me much more aware of the role of Asian divers in the pearl industry. Because after failing to introduce white divers in 1912, Asian divers in Broome were made exempt from the white Australian policy. So the pearl industry could continue. And in fact, Broome became one of the most cosmopolitan towns in Australia. Um, in the early 20th century, with Asian, Aboriginal, and white Americans all living together. And while I was in Broome, my friend Diana and Vincent Conroy said, We have to go to the Pearl White tourist port. As you can see here, the sea, the men, the legend. Um, and then this era, the divers wore the very cumbersome diving suits and they were connected to the lugger above by an airline. But it was actually at the Tourists talk that I discovered the blanket under trousers worn by the divers under their suits to keep warm as they searched for sharing. And if they were caught short when diving, the trousers have an open fly to enable peeing into a tube that then goes from the inside to the outside of the suit. It was really, I suppose, the personal and makeshift nature of this suit that really fascinated me. Clearly fabricated at home out of an old blanket, probably made by a woman. In the hierarchy of the pearling industry, the pearl lugger owners were generally white, using indentured labour, Chinese, Japanese, Copang, Malay, and Milliman, to dive for the pearl shell, which was regarded as, they said, no work for a white man. And this photograph of the pearling industry on the veranda of Broome is very revealing in how power and status are linked to whiteness and cleanliness. And in the beginnings of the pearl industry, it was very exploitative, um, with a high mortality rate amongst the divers from accidents from very burying the beds. And nearly a thousand divers are buried in the Japanese cemetery in Peru. And it was at this point I began to think about the terrible impact of the pearling industry on indentured labour from Asia. And I conceived the idea of making a pair of blanket under trousers covered with pearl buttons to make reference to this mortality. Um, and the title of the work is stitched on the button in the inside of the waistband on the button, sorry, in the inside of the waistband with pearl buttons. And they had the trousers, which are unbelievably heavy, if you sort of put them on, you have to sort of stand with the knees apart, otherwise they just slide down to your ankles. Anyway, I had them photographed from a Japanese man, Tadashi Nakamura, in the style of early documentary photographs. So he's not shown as an individual but person, but more as an anonymous body. Um, and in the exhibition, that trousers hanging over the back of the chair, I suppose, <coughs> indicate, um, I suppose, the dangers of, of the diver's life. And when I made this work, I began to sort of consider curating an exhibition that might address these issues by including these works I've made, but also, but also opening up the wider significance of pearl shirt in the multiracial community of Broome. The pearling masters often wore white drill suits fastened not just with pearl buttons but with actual pearls, um, <coughs> uh, shown here in the contemporary photograph. So I had a suit made to fit myself. This is a suit hanging in the exhibition. Um, and I had my photo photographed in this suit. I thought of it as an ironic acknowledgement of my whiteness. And having ironed and starched this suit by myself, I can vouch it took at least an hour to, uh, to iron one of these. And often young Aboriginal women um, trained in domestic arts in the Beagle Bay Mission were employed um, as servants in white households. And the men would actually change their suits two or three times a day as they got to, you know, 
I'm spoiled by dust and by sweat. Um, so the crisp white qualities of the pearling master's suit in the exhibition really contrast to the heavy weight of the pearl button trousers. I mean, they're so heavy they drag a diver down to his bed with war. Another reason for my fascination with Brew was the pearl shell altar in the Church of the Sacred Heart at Beaver Bay, which is a former Aboriginal mission, a hundred kilometres north of Broome. It's quite extraordinary when you come across this church, which looks as though it should be in Europe, in the sort of red Pindan desert. Um, and in the north west of Australia, Christianity was implicated in a very paternalist attitude uh, towards Aboriginal people. But it also offered them, as I said before, a haven against racial violence. And the church was built by German priests and the community during Beagle, at Beagle Bay during World War I when Australia was at war with Germany and the priests were interned at Beagle Bay. And the community just decided to make a virtue of this isolation and build their own church with the materials at hand. Um, and the use of pearl shell in the altar on the inside, shimmering and reflecting light, refer, refers to the importance of light, obviously, in the Christian tradition. But it also signifies the value of pearl shell to Aboriginal people as a sign for water, the source of life. And so eloquently stated by Mumba at Christmas Creek, the opalescent pearl shell is seen as, a, actually as embodying water. And as pearl shell ornaments, plain and inscribed, are traded between the people on the coast right through to Central Australia, just to the north <coughs> of South Australia, that connection of the pearl shell with water becomes even more prominent. The anthropologist um, Kim Ackerman, in his discussion of Kimberley pearl shell, says that for Aboriginal people, pearl shell is water, it embodies water, um, and its flashing represents the lightning that precedes the summer storms. And this Aboriginal elder, the salmon, is both wearing and holding pearl shell, which would be sort of flashed like this to catch the light in ceremony to bring rain. On my trip to Broome, I saw contemporary uh, pearl shells engraved by my unit lawman, Richard John Mannion, in the collection from Broome Historical Museum. And these shells are actually engraved in a naturalistic style, um, but they actually convey information about the stories of ancestral beings that animate Mannion's country around the Danfield Peninsula, as well as making reference to the pearling industry. And this sort of, I suppose, sparked my interest in Aboriginal pearl, decorated pearl shell. And I went to the South Australian Museum and had a wonderful collection of 19th century pearl shell. And the patterning on both these shells in part indicate is it making reference to the life and qualities of water. And so while the pearling industry saw the sea primarily as a sign of resources for the creation of wealth. The saltwater people, like the Javi and the Bardi, whose country is the Dantua Peninsula, the sea is a sentient being. Um, and when I was in Broome, I'd see contemporary shells engraved, engraved, sorry, engraved by a Javi man, Edward Tiger, who also carved a range of designs, all connected to his country, including shells carved with weather patterns. And through a young Barbie woman I met in the USA, a man is Masado, who done the honours thesis on Aboriginal use of pearl shell in Kimberley. I met her at her home in Jagadin and I was going to travel north to meet Aubrey, but of course, in the way of the symptom, we travelled up there, Aubrey had already gone to a funeral in Darwin. So eventually I borrowed some shirts from the short gallery, a short street gallery in Broome. And the shell on the left represents Cyclone Tracy, while the one on the right describes whirlpools that result from the strong tidal flows at the tip of the Bantua, Bantua Peninsula. In the exhibition, the historical pearl shell and the contemporary shell are displayed to represent enduring connections between pearl shell and the life giving properties of water. And I was thinking about Aboriginal people's understanding and respect for water as a source of life raise questions in my own mind about white attitudes towards water, where water is really regarded as a commodity to be bought and sold. So I made a couple of blanket words um, that allude to these different attitudes as a source of life and as a commodity. And in fact, the writer and journalist, Ernestine Hill, 
flew towards Wu in 1930, she described the stock mates as translucent as alabaster, bitter as brine, and solid as marble. So I was inspired by the pearl shell mosaic of the floor of the Beagle Bay Church and decided to create a large gyps of broken pearl shell on the concrete floor of the gallery to allude to these soft soft breaks. Um, and I suppose um, in my mind were a number of references. The um, middens piled high with broken shell, which is evidence of the presence of Aboriginal people over centuries. The glittering light on the surface of a dam held in pools as the tide received on Cable Beach, the finely cracked clay of the estuary, and of course the pearl shell white font in the cathedral of Broome. It took me about six weeks to prepare the shell and eight days to create the ellipse. It's about five metres um, at its longest point. And all that labour for an ephemeral work that was picked up and packed in boxes at the end of the exhibition. But I think this is a poignancy to the piece, because as like the water it refers to, it can disappear so swiftly. And every time it's shown, it needs to be remade, an allusion to the ongoing work that's required to address some of the issues raised by the exhibition as we grapple with how to maintain our most precious resource of water. Now, the final place I want to discuss is Papua New Guinea, where I spent most of my childhood a place that for decades I could only access through memory. Um, in this map, you can see Port Moresby down the bottom, and um, the Solomon Islands are well, to my right, to your left, and Bougainville. There's a, a line of little islands. Um, my family arrived in Port Moresby in uh, 1953 when I was six. My father took a position in the Weather Bureau as a forecaster. And we stayed for seven years, living, living in 1959. And my mother was the maker in our family. She made this sea glass basket for my brother when he was a baby, but he was born in 1953. And when my sister was born, 10 years after me in 1957, she was carried around in a book basket from the autonomous region of Bougainville. At present, it's part of the Papua New Guinea, but um, they're seeking independence from PNG in the referendum or hopefully later this year. So I think my interest in the indigenous baskets and their makers could probably be traced to my mother and my early childhood in PNG. And I went back to, um, to um, PNG for the first time in more than 50 years in 2013 with my friend Ruth McDougall, a curator at the Queensland Art Gallery, to go to the film festival, which was amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> It was extraordinary. Ruth was doing research for an exhibition on contemporary Papua New Guinea art called Number One Neighbor. And so we went to the Billum Festival. Ruth had seen here bargaining for a Billum. And of course, Billums are the netted bags, and they're worn by everybody men, women, children, um, made by the women and given to, um, to people. They are really quite extraordinary. And they're now they're making these amazing Billum dresses from the same. Um, <laughs> Um, all of them were originally made in clarified, I think there's one in the middle of the picture, but now they're made with commercial yarn, often in the brightest colours you can imagine. And in Baroka, they were all strung up on a wire fence along the main street. And I even found one with K. So he really invited me to um, participate in the Women's Wealth Project, a project that she curated with fellow curator, Sana Belai, designed to re reveal the cultural value and cohesive power of women's fibre practice in Bougainville, rebuilding itself after the devastation of the Bougainville crisis. I was really excited. You can tell you may remember the, the, um, the Bougainville crisis. There was a civil war that began as a dispute about the environmental devastation for the Panguna copper mine on the rivers and the gardens of the local people. And the dispute sort of ended as a, as a full blown civil war between Bougainville rebels and the PNG army, a conflict that probably lasted for 10 years and actually ripped the social fabric of the community apart. And so the Women's Wealth Project was not only focused on bringing attention to the amazing fiber practices of the women, but really to affirm their cohesive social and cultural value 
in rebuilding social connection. So about 15 artists from Bougainville and the neighbouring Solomon Islands participated, as well as three artists in Australia in Sydney, standing out of the toe. And we, um, <clears throat> and I think I was, uh, there were two Aboriginal artists, and I think I was selected really because of my interest in working with, collaboratively with Indigenous artists and because of my community connection. Um, for the project, we were housed in the Nazareth Rehabilitation Centre at Shabai um, for a 10 day, living, 10 day living workshop. We were then greeted um, with local visitors, local villagers, with this extraordinary <coughs> sort of ceremony of gifts. Um, it was the most beautiful place to be in. Um, there was a village nearby, the Rehabilitation Centre was really designed to house women that have been suffering from domestic violence, run workshops for people trying to sort of, I suppose, reintegrate um, people after the devastation of the war. Um, <clears throat> these, are, these are the little accommodation huts where we stayed. Um, the kitchen, everything was done on a fire. It was the generators only went on for a couple of hours in the, in the evening. And all the food was really um, grown in the garden. Apart from spam and sandwiches, <laughs> which actually reminded me, because I suppose protein is not really available apart from fish. Um, <clears throat> um, these are the spaces where we worked, and we really got to know each other and began to share our skills and learn about each other's culture. Not everyone shared a language, because there's so many regional languages in PNG, and the lingua franca is pop pissing, but I can hardly remember any of it. So we basically communicated through gesture and through looking at images. Marilyn Havini was a, was a crucial member of the workshop as a translator and for documenting all the participants' details. And she and her husband Moses were really key figures in negotiating the peace deal that ended the, the Bougainville crisis. So the women all brought along their traditional fireworks and body adornments to show us. Um, Adelaide Micaiah showed us how to make her buruku from black palm leaf, bush string and wood, and they used as fans and covers for food or babies. And they're also used in ceremony when they're decorated. The tutu hoods made here by Kiria Asiki and Elizabeth Watsi to keep off the heavy tropical rain are made from wild banana bark and pandanas, and they're sometimes stitched with symbolic patterns. And these forms are all made communally, and complex protocols and ceremonies are involved in collecting and processing the plant material and stitching the two here in the Wilco. And then these protocols and ceremonies bring the community together and reinforce social bonds. And as I said, play items are for everyday use, and decorated ones have symbolic significance. The two and hoods are often stitched with pendanus dyed with red dye called noni obtained from the tree root. And Sarah, Sarma and Curia showed us how to harvest the tree roots and make the dye for the pendanas, um, which comes out the most extraordinary red colour. Um, Taloi Havini, who is Mother and Moses' daughter, is the significant contemporary artist now living between Australia and Bougainville, who's made a powerful three-channel video called Habitat, that documents the environmental destruction created by the copper mine and its destructive effect on the social and economic viability of villages in the region. And here she showed people wearing their two hoods to keep off the rain. And when the rain comes down, you know, it is like from the throw a bucket of water over you. It's so heavy. The women use a diverse range of basketry processes with plant material at hand, stitching, twining, plaiting. Some are for everyday use, um, carrying fruit and vegetables, personal belongings. Some are made very quickly when needed from palm fronds. There's plastic bags and paper bags just don't exist. And in fact, you know, Sam would just pick up a palm leaf and make a little bag if she wanted to carry something around. Um, Elisa, a Kondamuka woman from Morton Bay, called the map with materials given her by the other participants. And Aida from Nakamuru Island made coconut fiber rope, which is used in canoe making and body adornments. And the Solomon Islands are ethnically <coughs> connected to Bougainville, and the nations have really only been separated through colonisation. 
and Joy and Gwendolyn from the Solomon Islands showed us the knitting techniques that they used to make a woman's traditional bag, which is wool from the head. And in fact, the, the, the stain is a woman, you know, is not ready for life unless she has a bag. <laughs> <laughs> so we should all be carrying bags around. Um, and now, as you can see from the photograph, some of the, some of the bags are made with polypropylene as well. And not knowing what to expect at the workshop, I took along some dried onion grass and introduced species like me, where I live in the Adelaide Hills, and Joy taught me the traditional netting process using a band of spacer. But dried onion grass is a very spiky, intractable material, <laughs> unlike the soft tulip bark used by the women. And so my very awkward version is of that traditional form. But that was really this culture of sharing um, and Joy and I didn't really you know, share a language, but we could certainly communicate through the making process itself. Some of the participants were potters, like Melba Takei from the Solomon Islands and Janet Fieldhouse from the Torres Strait, shown here teaching Sam and Joy how to coil a pot. So we did a traditional pot that sawdust firing in a salvage steel container, abandoned after the Second World War, that yielded a few intact. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the end of the workshop was concluded by a meeting where we really shared what we had um, learned and the bogey on the Solomon Islands women danced for our host. And in fact, every stage of the workshop was marked by ceremony, feasting, and dancing, and demonstrating how important cultural activities are in maintaining the social life of the community. And after the end of 10 days, we all began to think about what we were going to make for the exhibition, which would be in the White Asian Pacific um, Triennial. And the women went back home to engage their communities in creating bodies of work. And during the workshop, I began to think about my traditional cultural process, which is woven tapestry, so very different in its structure and making to the traditional fiber processes of the women. And I kept thinking about what Adelaide McKay had said during the workshop. And she said right at the beginning, here we are not wives, we're not mothers or grandmothers, we're just women doing what we love to do, here we are sisters. So I decided that I would um, just contract that to here we are sisters and weave a tapestry that really symbolised that sense of um, connection um, <coughs> between all of us when we were there. Um, so I wrote a list basically, naming all the women um, in the workshop, just their first name. I was going to have their full names and the place where they came from. It would be about 100 metres away. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to reduce it. And I did little painted um, samples of the texts. Um, and I must admit, it was an absolute joy to be working in colour because I based the colour of every woman's name on the clothes that she wore in the workshop. And they had the most amazing sense of um, colour. So it was, one of, it was a very pleasurable tapestry um, to weave. I mean, ideally, it's hung um, as one long strip, but I made it in three sections so it could, could, so it could be shown in, in three parts. As in one piece, it's 11 and a half metres long. The Women's Welfare Exhibition opened um, in November 2018, um, and all the women came, which was an extraordinary thing in the administration. You know, raising the money, getting the documentation for women who probably didn't have a birth certificate, any of the visas, um, <clears throat> and financial support. Um, and for them, it was just an extraordinary um, trip to come to Australia for the opening of the exhibition. Uh, <clears throat> um, this is Ruth and Sana opening our section, of the, which is housed in one room at APT9. And there were so many festivities. There were um, communal gatherings, um, drumming, dancing. And, um, it was really quite amazing, as well as um, lots of workshops for the children, but also for adults, where everybody learned how to um, um, use those traditional processes. I took my family around with my group of friends. This is my grandson, Jack, learning how to knit from Josephine. Um, <clears throat> Taloi have been, um, oh, this is Ruth and Sarah, 
um, and Lucy at the end. But to avoid having his video habitat um, <coughs> provided a glimpse of the context in which the women's work was actually made. Um, and these slides show the sort of examples of their practices um, shown in the women's wealth room. And this is the um, video by Tsuloi Havini. It's interesting that artworks arise for many reasons. Often they're quite unconscious when you start making them. It's really only reflection during and after the process that these reasons might rise to consciousness. And I was given some slides of my family of PhD in the 1950s, and as I was sorting through them, I was very abashed to realise that many of them were sort of natives who, you know, dress and sort of rather derogatory sort of type. Although my mother did name our house all in really different names. And I began to think that naming the women I had worked with so intimately for those 10 days was probably an unconscious impulse to really make amends for the racist attitudes that were so prevalent in um, PNG and Australia during my childhood. And I think we've so much to learn about our place in the world from Indigenous people in Australia and in the Pacific, and I'm really grateful for the opportunities I've had and the people who've shared the culture with me. So thank you.